Weather forecasting for captains. We're going to talk about what offshore weather models forecast, what things affect sea state, and offshore forecasts. Understanding what offshore forecasts are really telling you, believe it or not, it, it, most people don't know. Okay? So I'm going to run through a few definitions here with you. This is wave height. That's the measurement from the trough to the crest. So let's talk about wave period. Wave period, if you, if you took the crest of a wave and you, and you hit a stopwatch and you come up on the next wave crest and hit the stopwatch again, that's period. And I'm going to tell you as a captain that period is much more important than height. Do what? I can't tell you how many times I've been fishing in 14 foot seas that are 20 seconds apart. And you wouldn't even know, know it unless you were bottom fishing. You know those days that you're gliding out, most of you guys I would assume run, run smaller boats. Those days that you're gliding out and every once in a while you'll come up off the top of one, that's what you're seeing. All right. I can remember uh, some years ago I had a 25 aqua sport and I was coming across the Cape Fear River and it was probably two foot every one second and I broke the hard top. I broke the hard top. The leg on the hard top broke. See, it wasn't but this big, but it absolutely beat your teeth in. So it's always, 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 period is more important than height. Now, I will tell you that just based on my own experience, at about eight seconds, it's where it starts getting nice. You hit nine seconds, it's usually pretty nice. You hit 10 seconds and beyond and you're, you're getting into Lake Atlantic kind of stuff. But there's a kicker there too. You gotta watch out for the secondary wave and the triary wave. Wavelength, you guys probably don't talk too awful much in wavelength. Wavelength is the measurement from one crest to the other. We use that in a lot of the calculations that we do. When we do weather forecasts, we're using wavelength to, to, to get the forecast. But you know, generally we don't talk about it very much. And then we get significant wave height. When you read National Weather Service or you read any of these forecasts, all of us are forecasting significant wave height. This is where we get messed up with the forecast. Because significant wave height isn't the average sea that you see over the course of a day. That's over here. What we're forecasting is the highest one-third of waves. So out of the highest waves, we're doing one-third. Okay? Now, how does that work out in a real-time forecast? If the forecast is two foot to four foot, how many of y'all go fishing two foot to four foot? Hey, that sounds beautiful, right? One in ten waves will be greater than four feet. Wow. Think about sitting on your boat. One wave, two wave, three wave. It doesn't take long to hit ten, does it? So one in ten are going to be more than four foot. One in a hundred is going to be over five foot. And one in a thousand is going to be over six foot. Think about that. Maybe the, maybe, uh, the, the weather forecaster wasn't off quite as bad as you thought, huh? Here's our forecast, two to four. One in ten is four foot. One in a hundred is five foot. One in a thousand is six foot. Now here's the real kicker, guys. Here's the kicker. The highest wave that you will see over the course of the day is twice, is twice significant wave height. It's eight foot. What? They forecasted two to four and there's an eight footer? Maybe they wasn't off quite so bad after all, huh? I love fetch. Fetch is the distance the wind blows unfettered across the open ocean. Say that one more time fast. The distance the winds blow unfettered across the open ocean. The wind's blowing 20 knots right here. I don't care, well, actually I don't care if it's 20 knots or 50 knots. Right here where it starts to blow, it doesn't have enough time to get traction on the water to build the sea. So it takes a little time for this to happen. So you wind up going from ripples to chop to fully developed. Well, how far is fully developed? And this actually kind of surprised me. You get out here and let's talk about 20 knots. It takes 75 miles to get a fully developed sea. Wow. How many of you guys are south of Cape Fear? North of Cape Fear? Up around Moorhead? On a northeast wind? Here in Carolina Beach, if you go just outside my inlet, you will get your teeth knocked out. I don't care if it's 10 knots, 11 knots, 12 knots. Northeast wind, you will get your teeth knocked out. But you can go right here in Moorhead City, right up here against these shoals. In 20, 30 knots of wind, it's flat, it's flat as a pancake, right? 
On a southeast wind, predominant during the summer, we get the exact opposite effect. We can fish back in here behind these shoals and have no problem whatsoever. It's all about fetch. I like to describe fetch as when you're standing at your house and the wind's blowing and you walk around the corner of the building. If you're around the corner of the building, you're fine. But you step out from behind the corner of the building, whoosh, it's right in your face, right? That's the idea behind fetch. Waves interaction with the bottom. Depth that's greater than half the wavelength. Remember the, the whole wavelength measurement? If the depth is greater than half of that, you'll have no interaction whatsoever. It has no effect. It's when you get down to less than half, it's when they start peaking. And then you get down here to, what is it, 1 20th is when it breaks. Ouch, that's an inlet. You know, when you come rising up from 15 or 20 foot deep up to about four foot deep and you got the rollers all the way across. And, you know, I know most of you, y'all deal with shallow draft inlets just like I do. So uh, uh, you, gotta, you gotta watch that interaction with the bottom. Wave interaction with currents. One of the things that I learned very early on, I, I tell y'all a quick story. I was running this 38 Bertram. We we're going to the Gulf Stream the next day. I was a young captain. I said, man, you know what? I'm gonna beat everybody's butt out there today. <laughs> I'm going to leave early. So I got up at O Dark 30, hopped on the boat, come cruising out. Man, I came out from behind frying pan shoals, and I was climbing them. I'm talking about I was sitting upstairs looking up at them, cresting the wave, and over the course of the day, we crested one, and we come back down, and when we did, the, the four by four hatch in the back of the boat come out, come all the way up in the air and landed on the gunnel. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> what was happening there and what I was seeing was the wind was against the current. All right. Most of the current around the Gulf Stream is from the south, right? It's, it's flowing from the south to the north. Actually, southwest, northeast, but you get the idea. And the wind was against it. So the wind, wind was from the north. And that's what stood them up so much. So if you take the wind and the current and you put them against each other, it's going to shorten that period and it's going to stack them up higher. If you put the wind with the current, if the wind's blowing with it, and if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, it'll stretch them out and lay them down. This is one of the things that ReefCast does extremely well. ReefCast takes this into, into account. Some of our, our models and simulation, that this is what it's based on, that we can stretch them out and smash them together according to which way the wind and the current's moving. So now let's talk about you know, all the different types. So we got the National Weather Service. Here in, North, in the Carolinas, we're out in a 20 nautical, 20 nautical to 2,000 fathoms, right? I don't know whether y'all know it or not, but they're moving to a new format, thank goodness. Out to 20 nautical, 20 to 40, and then 40 to 2,000 fathoms, which is awesome. I mean, I don't know about y'all, that tickles me to death. The problem to me with the National Weather Service is that they cover such a broad area, it's kind of hard to take what they say into account for where you're fishing at. I mean, you know, even here locally, it's, uh, uh, was it New River to Cape Fear? Surf City to Cape Fear? They are moving to this secondary format though, which tickles me to death. They haven't done it here in the Carolinas yet, but in other parts of the country they already have. When you read a National Weather Service, make sure you read the synopsis. To me, the synopsis is probably the best part of all of it. The synopsis is going to tell you about what all is going on in the world. It's going to say, you know, there's a front moving through on Tuesday. It'll be here on Wednesday, and then it'll, it'll, it'll pass on Thursday, and a high pressure will move in. It's going to give you that general overview of the world, all right? So the synopsis is extremely important. They're good. These guys are professional forecasters, and most of them do a fairly good job. They're very, very good with the atmosphere in the air. They have consistent output, and it's air checked by hand. They use a lot of different information. Here's the bad. It covers a really broad area. There's a lot of area that, that, that they cover, and they have limited real-world experience. How many of you guys would love to put the weather forecaster on the bow of your boat that day? <laughs> Raise your hand. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I guarantee you their ears burn about every time that happens, too. Let's talk about the GFS model, Global Forecasting System. When you, when you guys see the spaghetti models for the hurricanes, a lot of times you're going to see the GFS is in there. This is an extremely popular model. You'll see a lot of places that use it. Um, and it's fairly decent because it does take into account the entire globe. They updated it this past year and it actually got a little bit better. Out three days, it's decent. It's not wonderful, but it's decent. You do see it in a lot of different places though because it's not copyrighted. Pretty good out three days, newly upgraded. 
It does wind speed, wind direction, and wind direction, I mean wind speed at 10 meters. Low resolution, because it covers the entire world, its data points are spread fairly far apart. It's good at general patterns, and it's not copyrighted. This is, this is a model that you see a lot on the internet sites that you go to. So let's talk about the North American model. The North American model here locally is the one that I prefer. Anywhere here in the U.S. coastline, North American model do, does a fairly good job. It's called NAM. Let's see here. Models run four times a day, 12 kilometer horizontal resolution. So that means it's got one data point every 12 kilometers. That's fairly fine for a large forecast. The problem with it is, is that uh, it doesn't take into account anything beyond its scope. So let's say it goes out four or 500 miles. Once it gets on out yonder, then it doesn't even know it exists. Let's talk about a hurricane 600 miles offshore and it only goes 400 miles and it doesn't, doesn't even know it exists. Wave Watch 3 model. Um, the Wave Watch 3 model is a very good model as well. Uh, we present this on Saltwater Central as uh, Wavecast. It's a great overview. I use Wave Watch a lot of times uh, as, as like the forest, okay, versus Reefcast, which is the tree. So, so I'll go look at Wavecast first, kind of get the overview of what's going on in the world, and then go to Reefcast to get that specific forecast. It's a deep water model. It doesn't, it doesn't really take into account the, the complete interaction of, with the bottom. So let's talk about Reefcast. I would assume everybody here has heard of Reefcast at some point or another. Reefcast is my baby. I love her. She's, she's pretty awesome. We've got two, two versions of it now. We've got modern and we've got classic. Both of them have, the, have their advantages. Um, I know when we rolled out modern, I think that first week, uh, they just about came to my house and burnt my house down and chased me out with the pitchforks. But we have both available, so you can have it either way that you want it. Both of them ha actually have advantages. If I'm in a hurry and I just want a good overview of what's going on in the world, then, th then I'll usually look at classic because I can just glance at it and tell you kind of what's going on. When I get specific the night before I'm fixing to go fishing, then I'm over here on modern because I can get more detail out of modern. It's a three mile by three mile forecast. 30 minute forecast data points, very accurate. We run about 93% to the buoys. That's out three days, 93%. I think most of the other national agencies run in the high 80s, 88, 89, somewhere right through there. This is a deep water, deep water model. It does not take into account the interaction with the bottom. But I will point out that it has an ensemble version that if you ask me, as far as I'm concerned, ensemble is the best version of it. If you recall, any time that we've got, we've got a solid, stable forecast, then ReefCast is saying, I know. And when, the reef, when ReefCast is jumping all over the place like it is here, that means, well, I don't know. It's the great thing about ReefCast and the great thing about the, uh, the ensemble version.